I'm heaven. I'm about heaven up to here, right? <laughs> Just about had enough of this heaven. We're going to go back and do something else, huh? <laughs> okay. All right, I've got, I got enough material for a, a lecture and a half. I'm going to try to squeeze it into one so we can do something else next week. So bear with me. I'm going to kind of zip right along with today. But today we're going to cover imagination and the reward ceremony and uh, wrap up heaven and next week we can start on something else. So prayers, first of all, what prayers do we, we need to remember? Yeah. Yes, yep. Um, for my brother, Drew. Drew? He had a heart attack this past week and has 100% blockage on one side and it takes him 20 years to get it. Wow. All right, so, yeah. Put it in with the sick, but now I gotta put an up arrow. All right. Granddaughter. Granddaughter. Name? Hey. Hey. How's she doing? Problems? Yeah. Okay. Going once, twice, thrice. Okay, let's go to our Father's prayer. Most Heavenly Father, once again, we come before your marvelous and wonderful throne with bowed heads and humbled hearts. First and foremost, and always to say thank you. Thank you so very, very much for blessing us. Blessing us so extraordinarily beyond what we, we have earned and what we deserve. Blessing us for all the spiritual things and all the material things. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come together this morning as a, a room full of, of Christian brothers and sisters to learn a little bit more about you, your way, what we can have us do here on this earth. And now before we start the class, we'd like you to reach out to you and ask you uh, wrap your loving arms and afford your special care to a few folks, uh, Joe and Steve and Harold, amongst our own uh, membership that always need your prayers. Also, please remember the, the families and the, the friends of all of these shootings that are going on. It's, uh, it seems like we're it's absolutely crazy. I can't begin to get my head around it, but there's a lot of folks out there that are grieving right now and, and they need your, your love. Please also reach out to uh, Drew, Heart Attack, uh, Crystal, the Roberts family, Ken Daly, and, uh, and Faith. Uh, please uh, help them as, uh, as only you can to get through their, their uh, struggles and trials. And a uh, thumbs up for Joe. Thank you very much for bringing him back to us. And now as we partake in this class, please uh, help us to impart these things to our heart and our heart to our actions so that we may walk in your way. We ask this in all things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, coming down to the end of heaven. And we're going to start with imagine that. Two quick topics to wrap it up. Imagine that. I can hardly read this thing now. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Tried to put my socks on this morning, twisted my back, and almost didn't get it. Okay. All right. Our future habitation deserves some heavenly speculation. Are we amazed enough? One of the things I've tried to do over the past couple of weeks is to get you to think outside the box that we typically think of heaven. We tend to apply our own material life and styles and knowledge to heaven. Heaven is so much more than that. And we really need to like open up and say, wow, that's even more than I thought it was gonna be. And so we wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Paul had a vision. Uh, but he was, he, excuse me, Paul had a vision, but wasn't allowed to tell everything that he saw. Um, he said, I know this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. Inexpressible things. 
Why do you think he was hearing inexpressible things? Because we weren't allowed to know them? Did everybody catch that? They are way far outside of our ability to understand. There's no way on this earth, with this brain, operating in this environment, that we'll ever get our head completely around the things that God can do. They are inexpressible. But we want to be there. And, and God has given lots of hints about what it's going to be like. But we have to realize that these are hints in human terms, trying to describe an environment in godly terms that we just don't have the words for. We have to use our imagination. All right. But when John received revelations, he was told to share it. So back in Corinthians, it was, here's the things that are inexpressible. Don't bother sharing it. I'm doing this for you, John. Now John goes to have his revelations, and now he's specifically told to share it. Don't hide it. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy. We can't anticipate something unless we imagine what it will be. So in revelations, God, through John, is planting the seed to get us to stretch our imagination. And the very first time you read, read revolutions, <laughs> revelations, your mind is stretched. Okay, it is. It's it's kind of kind of chapter, kind of book that is uh, going to really force you to do a little mind bending. And that's exactly what it does. Yes, it's apocalyptic, but it's apocalyptic based upon scenarios, which I believe are based on the fact of what is. The descriptions are apocalyptic just to get us to get outside of our normal thinking. But once we get outside of that normal thinking, this apocalyptic picture points as a theme towards something that we need to we need to know. This this the end of the earth, the eschatological end of these times is going to be an awesome, wonderful thing if you're a member of the family of Christ. And not a very good thing if you're not. So he's trying to get that across. God wants us to imagine it. That's the key takeaway. So it's okay. Turn on your imagination. All right, let's look at the city of heaven itself. Hebrews 11, 16. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So God is talking in our terms as cities. Large congregations of uh, people, things to do, lots of activity, things going on, buildings. We're trying to we're trying to get us in the mind of thinking. If you're back in this in the first century AD, and Jerusalem was a huge city, but most of the cities were kind of small. You know, maybe 100, 150 people, 200 people in a, in a little village with miles and miles between them. So we need to get this, this stretch our imagination a little bit. A city. Hebrews 13, 14, for here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking a city to come. So we don't have a lasting city. We we have some pretty nice cities, but I'm not sure if we have any cities that are worth going through what a Christian would be required for a whole life to get to. What they're saying is this city is way beyond what you want to work towards. And it's massive. Revelation 21:15. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width. And its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with a rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured the wall 72 yards according to human measurements. Human. Human, human measurements. That 1,500 miles is you know, a disagreement on what a, a stadia is. Of course, it didn't say miles in the original text, but somewhere 1,400, 1,500 miles. Can you imagine a city, one city, that's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles? We think we got some skyscrapers now, okay? That is a huge city, huge city. And that's the point that God's trying to get across here. What is the shape? What's the shape of this, this city? Yeah, yeah, almost. Cube. Did everybody hear that? It's a cube. Why do you think he describes it as a cube? Is that where the Muslims got their cube? You're jumping ahead. <laughs> but yes, it is. Uh, actually, yeah, that, that big black box is a cube also. And it is based on the same concept. 
What else in the Bible is a cube? How about the Holy of Holies? 20 by 20 by 20. So in the middle of the city of Jerusalem, there exists a cube. It's called the Holy of Holies. And it's literally a cube. So what is this, this cube concept? Why should we want to make a city look like something that was only 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits? Who lived there? God. That was the place where one priest was allowed to go one day of the year, and they literally tied a rope around his feet in case anything happened to him while he was in there, they could drag him out, because they can't go in after him. One person, one day of the year, into that one cube where God lives. Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the new city of Jerusalem is a cube, and it's 1,500 miles cubic, so that God and everybody can live there. Or anybody that wants to be there can be there. The city is a temple. God lives there, and so can we. Literally, we can actually live in that cube with God. All right, so is the New Jerusalem the only city? Don't know. Hmm? Don't know. Don't know. Okay, well, let's look. Remember on the parable of talents? It says you get to manage ten cities, and you get to manage five cities. Okay. What does that infer? There's at least 15 <coughs> cities out there, okay? 16 if you count Jerusalem. Yeah, there are going to be more cities. The cities has gates with people coming in and out. Rev 21, 25. Why, why would you need gates in the walls of the New Jerusalem to go in and out if there wasn't something else out to go to? Yeah, there are probably, by inference, there probably is other cities. In fact, there's probably lots of cities. But the main city, the city, the one city that, you, that God lives in is the New Jerusalem. And that will be the main city and inhabited with people from everywhere. Think of that. Complete diversity. Nowadays, if you're a woke corporation, you better have an executive chief officer in called the DEO, a D D E I, Chief DEI, Diversion, Equity, and Inclusion. Okay. Uh, and, and if you're not a big corporation, well at least have someone in your HR staff that has a card that says, I am DEI. Okay. Heaven is going to be DEI beyond steroids. We are literally told that we're going to have complete diversity, all cultures. Right? Every culture, every language, every kind of food to enjoy, all kinds of music from all around the, the world, and from all times. There ain't going to be any city here that's going to even get close to the city of Jerusalem. So if you enjoy at all, if you get any enjoyment whatsoever about meeting new people, learning new things, how they live, how they eat, how they work with their families, this is going to be the absolute greatest diversity that you will ever experience. And the nicest thing about it, remember last week we talked about, and all of these people, you're not going to have to worry about them giving you a hard time because they're all there for the right reason, with the right track record, doing the right things. Everybody's going to be righteously enjoying each other's company. So we get to enjoy everything that's ever been or could be or had been and all different kinds of people and cultures. We get to enjoy meals from every possible family setting for all times. And we're going to love each other doing it. It's going to be awesome. Ed, you'll get anybody to convert, though. So you'll, I, I, you won't have a chance. I said, Ed will not have an opportunity, though, to convert somebody. They're already going to be converted. So you'll worry about it. Yeah, you'll worry about it. You'll have, you'll have fun and dress it. Yeah. By the way, that's the one thing you can't do in heaven. Sorry. Too late. Too late. <laughs> the one you want to work with, you can't get to. All right, anyway. But without the things we don't like, this is going to be a fabulous, fabulous city. But without the things we don't like, no potholes, no crimes, no smog, OK? Can you imagine driving around with no potholes? That's heavenly. 
dead? That's wonderful. No crying this morning. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and my battery won't die. <sighs> it's also going to be a city of remembrance. Every week we do a little ceremony on remembrance. We do the, the Lord's Supper. We do the communion. We remember. The city is also going to be a city of remembrance. The number 12 appears in the description of the city. 12 things are going to appear. Does anybody want to curb in on what they are? Gates. Over the gates, over the gates, over the 12 gates, are going to be 12 names of the tribes, the tribes of Israel. So all the tribes are going to be remember. When you come through a gate, you're going to remember the tribes. When you get inside the gate, but all, all the walls are going to be the names of the 12 apostles. Whenever you enter that city, whenever you wake up and look around that city, you will have everything you need to know, everything you need to see to trigger a remembrance, a remembrance of God's plan. This whole existence in the New Jerusalem is a result of God's plan that started way back when, the 12 tribes of Israel, and how he brought them together and became his people, and then bring Christ and the 12 apostles to make his people and so forth. So the entire city is going to be a place of, of remembrance. The gates of the 12 tribes, the walls of the names of the 12 apostles. We will be forever reminded of his great plan. Okay. Imagine, if you will, the safety of heaven. Does anybody here worry about maybe walking down a street at night, dark street? Do you live in South Chicago? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can. In fact, you can't even safely be in your house unless you've got really thick front walls. Um, yeah, so imagine the safety of the city. Let's do Revelation 21 25. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for be it, there will be no night there. That's probably somewhere between metaphorical and apocalyptic. Is there never going to be any night there? Well, possibly. But really, what is he trying to say? The light will always be there. The light will. Well, why do we use the word light to talk about safe and unsafe? God is light. And, and that light can't go to you. Exactly. So, that, so that, that's the, here's the, the word of the, the use of the word light. This is, light is God's love, is God's protective arms. And here's the city where we don't have to worry about night descending upon the city and darkness descending upon the city. There will be no night there. We will have God all the time. No security needed. Nothing impure will ever enter it. You know, God put a couple of cherubims around the Garden of Eden to make sure that he kept all the bad guys out. When it comes to heaven, it's going to be well protected from any bad guys because the bad guys are somewhere else. <laughs> exactly. They're somewhere else. So what is the biggest joy stealer right now in your lives? What is the thing that steals the most joy from you right now? Fear. Close. Is a variation on that? Yeah. Illness. What are all these things? All of these things are a subset of worry. I worry. <coughs> I worry about this pain. I worry about that pain. I worry about getting rumbled by a car. I worry about the car I'm even starting. I worry, I worry, I worry. I worry about sickness. I worry about fear. I worry about all sorts of stuff. I spend my half my life worrying about something. Ain't gonna be no worry in heaven. No worry in heaven. Not anymore. It's finished. Okay. It's kind of like the guy. Kind of a, a real downbeat fellow, always depressed, feeling rotten, never really happy. Can't say a, a, a happy word. And then one day he comes in to work. And he is just thrilled, he's smiling, he's happy, he's skipping, he's, and he's, wow, this guy made a total turnaround. So the other, his fellow office worker said, what, what happened? What did you do? He says, I finally got rid of worry. I hired someone to do all of my worries. All of my worry hired away. That's awesome. How much does it cost to hire someone like that? I don't know, that's his worry. <laughs> all right, no more worry. All right, bottom line on expect up on, on imagine that. We need to be expecting, we need to be imagining beyond our expectations. 
whatever our expectations are today about heaven, what it's going to be like, consider yourself minimally partway there. You need to magnify your expectations. And the same thing with your imagination. Very, very few people actually allow their imagination to go completely unbounded. We sit down and we imagine things, but we wrap boundaries around it. Don't imagine beyond this, don't imagine beyond that. Compared to the life we're living here, heaven does not have any boundaries. We just, we need to unleash our imagination. If it's wonderful, if it's awesome, if it actually causes you to get up in the morning with a smile on your face and go, I'm gonna do this and this and this, that's the kind of imagination that we want to, want to see going on here. One last quote, Colossians 3, 1 through 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. If you set your mind on things above and not on earthly things, you're getting close to imagining what heaven's going to be like. And it's going to be the one of the greatest drivers towards helping you get there. We were made by God to live in the new earth and the new heaven. We weren't made to spend eternity here. No time constraints. No, anything, anything constraints. No time. Yeah. No time. No time. Yeah, that's, that's another, but hey, that's two or three lectures all by itself. What, what, what time is it in heaven? All right, any questions on imagination before we jump on the next one? Okay, come down the wire, wrapping up the course. Now you got 12 minutes to do it. All right, God is a rewarder with rewards that are significant and lasting. That's in the scripture. Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he reward, rewards those who earnestly seek him. The key word here is faith. You need to have faith. I know we've, I've, I've done this in classes many times, way, way back, but when I first started talking about what's true, absolute truth, relative truth, and all that kind of stuff, absolute truth is one of the most difficult concepts to get your head around. I know, I absolutely can positively know that there is such a thing as absolute truth. And a year ago, when we talked about evidences, we talked about how do you know what's true and untrue, and we came to the conclusion that the Bible is, in fact, God's word, and what it says is absolutely true. The problem with absolute truth is that you can declare it, but you can't prove it. All right? I'm sorry, but I cannot prove that there's an that, that absolute truth exists. Only God can, because he can see everything. I would have to have the vision of a God to prove that absolute truth exists, but I know it exists. And the gap between knowing and believing is called, that's that faith. Sometimes you'll hear people use the word leap of faith in a, in a negative way, okay? No, this, there is a leap of faith. You can go so far with evidence. You can go so far, and here's absolute truth. You, you have to make a leap. You have to make a little step into the unknown, okay? It's the difference between belief that and belief in, all right? Police officers believe that a Kevlar vest will stop a bullet, okay? There's a story about a, a guy, a policeman that walked up to a car on a traffic stop, coming up on the car, he turns around, he's talking to the guy, give me your wallet, so forth and so on, and the guy is pulling his gun out. He can see the gun coming up, all right? The cop can also reach for the gun, but he knows darn well that that guy in the driver's seat is going to have his gun up and pointed and pull the trigger before he can clear his holster. And at that point in time, that cop had to make some really fast decisions. He had belief that the Kevlar vest would stop him. So he leaned forward into the car so you couldn't see his head and you couldn't see below his waist. He knew he was gonna take a shot in the vest. And he knew that the second shot would be his in the guy in the car. And he did it, why? Because he didn't only believe that the Kevlar vest would stop a bullet. He believed in that vest. And that's the difference between knowing God and following God. <coughs> knowing Jesus and following him. 
not only believe that, you believe in. And that last little bit is that step we call faith. Even the people that don't believe in God, they have to have faith in what they believe to say there is no God. How can you say there is no God if you aren't God and can see everywhere God hides? By its very definition, atheism can exist, can't be proven. So they also take that leap. That leap is what saves us. Don't ever let anyone put you down by saying, oh, that's a big leap. All right, anyway, if you, if you take the leap towards God, that's, your, that's the start of your admission ticket. Um, so talking about rewards now, I'm dry as a bone. Remember back in Matthew, we talked about the parable of the talents, where you could double your talents, you could double your rewards, so to speak. So this is an indication that perhaps God does have some rewards in mind. Your actions can, in fact, earn you a reward. Likewise, your inactions can unearn your reward. And what you started with, the third guy, you know, one, one uh, uh, talent, he buries it, that, that story. But scripture clearly says that heaven is not a reward. First Peter 1 4, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept for you. So he's talking about heaven not as a reward, but as an inheritance. An inheritance is a gift freely bestowed by the rightful heirs. Key word there upon the rightful heirs. Key word there is heirs. What is the difference between heirs and anybody else? You are related. You are part of a family. If you are in a family, you are now eligible for whatever the heirs of the family is eligible for. So you can't earn your way into heaven. You can't earn your way into salvation through your own deeds. But by being a member of the family, you can get that, quote, reward, which is really an inheritance that's being held for you. So where do you need to be? You need to be in Christ. You need to be in the family. And because everybody that is in heaven is in Christ, the side benefit of that is everything we've already talked about, enjoying all these people without any worry of being put down, stepped upon, diminished, riled, whatever. It's a righteous place. Everybody's in Christ. All right. And grace. So you take the leap. You say, I am yours. You become part of the family. And then God says, by my grace, I will give you membership in the family and therefore qualify you for the inheritance of heaven. Kind of split in the hair, but sometimes you need to. Particularly people think they are earning their way into heaven. And you'll hear that a lot. Somebody does this, does that, does this, does that. Boy, they're a great person. They're going to heaven. Maybe. Maybe. A lot of times you just have to bite your tongue and go, okay, sure. All right. So we'll get this rewards ceremony concept and bring it out of that. All right. So heaven is not a reward. However, Heaven is a place of rewards. Heaven itself is not the reward, but in heaven is where you can enjoy some rewards. Like for example, from this world, we're going to be judged by our faith and obedience, okay? What we do, how we behave ourselves, how we come to God, how we join his family, and then how we conduct ourselves until the day we die, that is going to judge us in terms of our destination, okay? Being in Christ and being a member of the body and obedient to his words, that is our admission, our destination. How we lived our lives here, however, will be evaluated to determine our occupation and compensation. So being in Christ will get you there being in Christ, fulfilling all of his commands, and working beautifully towards spreading his word, helping other people, all of those activities, in themselves, they wouldn't have gotten you there. 
because you're already in the body and you're doing all of those things, that helps determine what your occupation and compensation is. Okay? Uh, Second Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So uh, the person who is baptized, joins the body, goes home, sits back, and spends the rest of their life in front of the TV. I don't know. I don't know. At the very least, who says, who's going to pick up the trash? Somebody in last week said, yeah. At the very least, we probably just made a trash picker, okay? If there's trash in heaven. I don't know they're going to be trash. I think everything recycles. Poof. It's back again, good again. <laughs> anyway, but if that's all you do, your occupation ain't going to be something to write home to mom and the kids about. By following God's commands after baptism and living a life of things that supports and fulfills the kingdom, I think that's what's going to get you the, the better job. Uh, Ephesians 6 8. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever they do, whatever good they do, whether they are slaves or free. It doesn't matter where you came from. You buy your ticket by getting into Christ, and then you buy yourself a nice occupation in heaven by being forever obedient, helpful, working towards all of the a little extra. Take that logic to the extreme. I guess we could, uh, on both both ends, uh, this occupation and compensation is an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. So someone could be basically at what we would consider, in human terms, he's at the top of the heap as far as he's going to be a senior VP or a CEO and greatly compensated for that. All right, that's one end. Let's go to the other end. So you're saying that someone will have an occupation that is what we would consider such oh, miserable. That's terrible that you would be employed in that kind of position and be compensated in a very poor manner. Well, okay. So let me answer that question. I shall. I'll answer it and then I'll joke about it. Um, Everybody that goes to heaven is going to be totally blown away by the awesomeness of it, the absolute beauty of it, the fact that I get to live my life, rest my life, return to here. It's super, super wonderful. So the lowest job in heaven is going to blow everything we think of here. However, if you go above and beyond, you're going to be in charge of 10 cities. That does not mean every person has his own 10 cities. and cities are really little teeny, teeny things. Some people are going to do a little bit more and they're going to be in charge of 10 cities or five cities. You get you did little, I won't give you much more to do. There is going to be, in my mind, opinion, a differentiation between what we do, but even the lowest scale job being, I don't know, whatever you can do in the city that's an admiral job, admiral job to do, but still it's in heaven. It's going to be awesome. I. I I really can't get much detail than that, but I suspect I'll take it myself. I would gladly take the worst job in heaven, if heaven is what I think it's going to be. Okay, and let me add this up. Let me explain it with a story like this. A cab driver and a preacher both die on the same day. They go to heaven, they stand there before St. Peter at the Golden Gate, does their evaluation, okay, you're both good to go. And he starts with his hand, takes a little key ring with a key on it, and he hands it to the, uh, to the preacher, and says, that, that's your place over there. It's a nice little house, you know, one bedroom house over there on the hill. He takes a key ring and hands it to the cab driver. And he says, all right, that's your house up there on top of the hill. It's a mansion, it's a huge mansion, it's beautiful. You've got servants, hot and cold, folding doors, everything you can possibly imagine. That house is a mansion. Enjoy it. And the preacher going, wait a minute, wait a minute. I spent my entire career preaching about you, and I get a shack, and he gets a mansion. And 
It builds up to this. It's the result, man. It's the result. When you were preaching, by the end of your sermon, half the folks were sound asleep. When he was driving his cab, people were wide awake and praying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, an interesting passage here is, is Romans chapter <coughs> 2, uh, 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 starting in verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to, according to, he were his deeds. Yeah. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immor immortality, eternal life. So according to his deeds. So the, the reward is a measure to, to your deeds. It's according to your deeds. The way I think about it is like it's the difference between infinity and infinity plus one. Okay. If this is bad, I you're not going to be a five minute, are you? No, okay. If this is bad and good, and heaven is this, okay, then I don't mind having this, this job here because it's this much bigger than the best we've ever imagined. But that, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Paul alluded to those uh, idea of the greed in heaven, yeah. and, the, and it talks about the greed in hell. The one that has the greater punishment that's going to get it is the one that. Um, betrayed the Lord and anyway but Paul says that if we stay faithful and he was doing this to help preach to stay faithful he said there will be a, more than rubes in my crown right, yeah. because you're staying faithful is something that Paul's going to be happy about seeing you yeah. there and you know, that before you. so he's going to have a greater reward yeah. by you staying faithful yeah. and, and, and you mentioned rewards in hell yeah I also believe that the rewards in hell are I mean, if you just go to hell and burn in hell, that's bad. But if you go to the section of hell that's burning and your coffee's cold, that's really hell. <laughs> <laughs> one person, always, always gonna be one person. All right, <laughs> All right. now I'm talking to play. <laughs> your admission to heaven is based upon faith, but your role in heaven is based upon the fruits of that faith, okay? So faith gets you there, the fruits get you even better. And I'm not sure about what you can get promotions in heaven too. So, uh, but all fruit is not equal. Many Christians learn after Judgment Day that some of their fruit got them to heaven, but some of it got burned up. 1 Corinthians 3, 12, 15. Anyone who builds on the foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, straw, but on the Judgment Day, Fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. But if the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. So yeah, I, I believe there's gonna be variations on your jobs in heaven. So the question then is, where's your fruit? You're still here. You ain't in heaven yet. Last week I suggested that heaven was so wonderful and all the wonderful things that we were going to do in heaven, all the things we were going to enjoy with each other, why not start now? Well, same thing this week. If it's gonna be based upon your fruits, let's start working on our fruits now. Okay? So, heaven is a place of reward, all right? Truly, truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. But you can lose your reward. Your, your, suffice it to say, you can lose not only your, your reward in heaven, but your entry into heaven. So stay focused on the right stuff. Luke 14. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, then at the resurrection of the righteousness, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. So we're starting to receive these fruits. God recognizes his different children will bear different fruit and reward them accordingly, like the cab driver, okay? So what does God award? 
personal commendation. That's an award. First Corinthians 4 and 5. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. God is actually going to praise something I did. The perfect being is going to praise me. So it says, this place is really, really out there. You got to do some serious imagining here now, okay? God wants to shake your hand and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. How about individual delegations? There will be eternal promotions. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, you take charge of 10 cities. Yeah. You may actually pick up an extra city here and there, based on how well you do. But there will also be some reversals. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So this is a two-way street. This is a two-way street. And we've got to keep working on it, even in heaven. But we will want to. We will be sitting there in the same place as God, totally awestruck. How could you not want to do everything it takes to make that guy happy? Maybe not. All right. What does God award? Eternal celebration. I enjoy being celebrated. I enjoy a birthday where they come up and pat you on the back and say, good job, Billy. You know, I enjoy a little celebration. I enjoy a little pat on the back. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's celebrate together. Luke 25, 21. Heaven's reward means everything that we do for Jesus will last. Jesus is going to forget a lot of stuff. He's going to forget our sins. But he's not going to forget the things that really last, our good deeds. And a good point to, uh, for us to recognize is he's going to say that to us no matter where our level was. Yeah. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's right. celebrate together. So yep. even if you're just in charge of two cities, God wants to charge, he still wants to celebrate with you just as much as the person who is with 10 cities. And living in a world today with a government that we have today, I am looking forward to the day when the guy who is the biggest chief in charge is just as humble and makes me feel just as comfortable and welcome as the guy down at the bottom or at the bottom of the letter. We are all humble. So that's the course. Are you heaven bound? Questions, comments? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Heaven's reward means everything we do for Jesus will last. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is useful. Yeah. I don't believe you're the Luke 25, 21. Uh, no, you probably get another one. Luke 25, 21. It's not a Luke 25, 21. That's probably a typo. Do you know what scripture this is? Not here. <laughs> uh, anybody? Luke, well done, good paper server. Maybe somebody can Google that while we're, we're going here. Yeah, I... Maybe it's Matthew 25, 21. That could be. After the sun goes down, if I'm still typing, errors go up. Yeah. Questions and comments? You've got, you've got three minutes. So what about the who? What about the who? The original who in Mecca. Oh yeah, basically what the, in Islam. Matthew 25. Yeah, it's Matthew. All right, so the, the Muslim cube, in the Muslim tradition, Abraham went with what was not what was the not Isaac, the other brother. Ishmael. Abraham, Ishmael. Abraham went with Ishmael to the Saudi Arabia area. They visited there, they studied there, they worshiped for a while. They built a, uh, a, uh, uh, a stone remembrance sculpture. And then later on, now we're talking like five, so 500 AD, somebody came back and re restructured this, made a cube out of it, saying this represents where God lived, i.e. Abraham. Yeah. All right, let me just give you a little hint about next week then. One minute. Next week we're going to start a new series on um, what I call building a biblical worldview. Uh, 
this this is a uh, a course I wrote back in uh, back in the summer before Obama was elected. What would that be? Oh six, eight, oh eight. I think anyway. And I wrote this back at a time when there was a lot of uh, angst going on about Christianity and how Christianity was taking the beating in the country. The country was going downhill, and we had guys like that. Uh, was that Reverend in Chicago that was it up on the, uh, Reverend Wright? Right, Reverend Wright. Jackson. No, no, the Reverend Wright. Right. Right. Not, not right. God bless America. God bless America. Anyway, back in that time, I was really frustrated. So I wanted to put together something that will allow us to, to ask ourselves: Are we operating with a worldview that is biblical, or are we operating with a worldview that is secular? So we'll start off with the take-home test. You take the test and it measures where you're at. This is not a test that we share with other folks. You don't have to share it with your wife or your husband. It's a personal thing. You take the test, put it off to the side. Then we're going to go through all of the test questions. It is mostly a discussion class. Very, very little lecture, if at all. I'm just going to say, well, read the verse. What do you think? And for each of the different determinants of whether or not you're scripturally oriented or secularly oriented, we'll talk about what does that scripture mean in terms of your biblical worldview. And if you want to get there, how do you get there? So it's basically a, it's a discussion interaction class. And I'm guessing it'll last me about five or six weeks. So next week, I will hand out to you a booklet that has the test, the answer sheet in it folded up so you can sneak a peek. And I think the first section we're going to talk about. And then each week, I will make handouts of the things we're going to talk about with you to scribble notes on if you want. And then at the very last time, you take the same test again to see if your worldview has changed. This is kind of a different, definitely different transformational class, and that'll be next week. And that uses up all our time.